Calvary. Uh. Nope. Yes. All right. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing that it was for me that God. was free, hard and there was multiplied to me, there my burden so found liberty, a Calvary, by God's word at last my sin I learned, then I tremble at the low iceberg, till my guilty soul imploring turn to Calvary. There was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. A Calvary. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as I king. Now my rapture soul can only sing. Oh, Calvary, mercy, there was grace and grace was free, pardon, there was multiplied to me, there my burden so from liberty, a Calvary, all the love that true salvation's plan, all the grace that brought it down to man, all the mighty gold that God did span at Calvary. Mercy, there was faith and grace was free, pardon, there was multiplied to me, there my burden so from liberty at Calvary. As the deer panted for the waters, so my soul longed after you. As the deer panted for the waters, oh my soul longed.
cards now. Sing the chorus again. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Amen. And great singing at this time. Brother Josh is going to come. He's preaching for us today. And then True North, we're going to be downstairs for our Bible study. So all our, our um, college and career age, head downstairs. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord again? I love that song. That song really always gets me because, you know, our hearts are supposed to be close to the Lord. And I feel like that's... That's the whole point of us even coming to church is that we want to get closer to God and we want to love him with everything that we have. And we're not perfect, but God is going to use us despite of that because he knows and he sees our heart. And that's the important thing about us being Christians is that we don't, we don't have to pretend. It's thankfully that we can give all that we are to God and he accepts us just the way we are. Amen. And uh, so today, this morning... Um, I'd like to start with the title of my message, and it's going to be Conviction and Correction in Teaching. And I'd like to start with a short story. It's just an anecdotal story, so it doesn't, it's not really a true story, so to speak, but it gives us an idea of kind of what I'm going to be going into my message today. And so this, there's this young boy. His name is Sanju. And unfortunately for Sanju, when he's very young, his father passes away. And so he's left alone with his mother, and it's just him and his mom and nobody else in the world. And so his mom tries the best she can to raise him as a good son, um, but she unknowingly starts to spoil him, thinking that she got, she's got to give him everything that he wants, everything that he needs. And so one day, Sanju comes home from school, and he has a pencil box from another student that he's stolen. And so his mother is really worried. What's she going to say to her son? She doesn't want to hurt his feelings but she knows it's not right. So she tells him, tomorrow take back that pencil box. And so the next day comes, and Sanju comes back home from school, and his mom looks and sees in his bag that he still has the pencil box. He hadn't given it back. And so she's really stuck with a, a dilemma now because she's, you know, I've told him what to do, but I, I, I know my son, he has no father. He has nothing. You know, it's just a pencil box. Maybe that's all he'll steal. I, I've already warned him. That, that should be enough. And so unfortunately, that's not where it ended. Because Sanju keeps going back to school, and every time he goes back to school, he takes something else from one of his friends. And this pattern gets worse and worse. But the mom, she's stuck because she said, I've already warned him, I don't know what else to do. And so she just says, you know what? He'll, he'll grow out of it, it'll be fine. One day, everything will be okay. And so as Sanju gets older, he not only starts stealing from his friends and from people at school, he starts to see stuff in the windows of his shops when he's going by. And so he starts taking the things from the windows in the shop. And one day he finally gets caught. And at that time, he's about to go to jail and his mom gets rushed out so that she can see her son before he goes to jail. And he's, you know, handcuffed and he's taken into a car. And right before he's taken into the police car, he yells back something to his mom. And his mom starts crying. And what he said to his mom was, it's all your fault that I'm going to prison. And now we know it's his fault. Sanju chose to steal. But his mom was crying and crying and crying, saying, like, how is it my fault? What did I do, my son? And so he responded and said, you know, you never taught me. You never corrected me when I was a child. You never made me give back that pencil box. It was just a pencil box, but that's what led me down this road. And, you know, the sad thing about that story, and it's going to be reflected a little bit in what I'm uh, reading today, is that when we don't correct and we aren't able to be corrected, things get out of hand. And maybe, you know, our convictions are that we want to do what's right. And for the mom, she wanted to take care of her son. Her, she had conviction. We all have convictions. But that conviction of hers was not based on truth, and it wasn't based on what was right. And what did it end up doing? 
She thought, I'm going to prevent some pain and hardship for my son. I'm going to prevent pain and hardship for myself. But ultimately, there was much more hardship. If she had not had her son go to jail and do all these thefts and stuff, she would have had a much easier, nicer life. But she didn't, she didn't take that into account. She thought, oh, I should, just, I should just go easy on him. And so that's kind of part of what I'm going to be teaching in my message today. I'm going to go into three different kings and um, the convictions that they held and the correction they were willing to have or willing to take or willing to give to the people and the results of that. And we can see already from this story that there's going to be some negative results. Um, but let's start um, with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our message. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that we can be here again in church, Lord, and that you're the God who loves us so much, and that you correct us and you convict us of what's right. And I thank you, Lord, that the teaching that you have for us is for all of us, and there's something for all of us here today, this morning. And I just pray that you use this word and your word to encourage our hearts and to convict and to correct us, Lord, and to correct me, Lord. We're all sinners, Lord. None of us is above correction. And just as we're going to see today with the kings, we need to be willing to accept correction and have the right conviction in our lives. And I just pray that in a small way today, we can uh, make some of those changes, Lord, and keep going for you day by day. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let's turn first uh, to 1 Kings chapter 12, and we're going to look at our first king. And so 1 Kings chapter 12. Okay. And so we're going to start with King Rehoboam. I'm going to read the stories of the three kings, and then we're going to get into um, the convictions that they had and the correction that they um, experienced. And so we'll start reading in 1 Kings. Uh, Kings chapter 12 and verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. And Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, if thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people? Who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make it thou lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lead you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly, and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you as scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite, unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel! 
Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Okay, I just want to give a little bit of context um, for this story because we're talking about Rehoboam the king. And he is the son of the famous Solomon. And Solomon was the wisest king ever in, in God's eyes in the Bible. And in his life, Solomon started off in a really good way, in a godly way, but he ended off really poorly. And we talk a little bit here about um, Jeroboam in the first, in the early verses. And the reason why we're talking about Jeroboam, if we look back one chapter, we see Solomon um, building all these palaces and, and places for idol worship for his uh, wives that he had, many wives that he had. And that's what turned his heart away from the Lord. And so God promised him that if he was going to disobey him, God was going to take away the kingdom from Solomon, which he did. And part of that promise was given in um, uh, 1 Kings 11 and verse 30. So I'll read that 30 and 31. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take thee 10 pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give thee 10 tribes to thee. And so we see that Jeroboam is promised that he's going to get the kingdom. And Solomon is still alive at this time. So Solomon becomes very angry and he looks to kill Jeroboam. He, he's gone so far away from the Lord that he's willing to kill Jeroboam, even though it's not Jeroboam's fault, it's his fault for sinning. And so he tries to kill him and, Sol, and Solomon chases after Jeroboam, but Jeroboam flees. And so that's, we, that's how we see the setting of chapter 12 for um, Rehoboam, and we see Jeroboam coming back because the people call Jeroboam back. He was a good guy. He, he had worked really hard for King Solomon. Um, so that's just a little bit of the background that we had for him. Um, and then, so now we're going to go into our second passage, and it's going to be on another king. And this king is Jehoash, or often known for short as Joash in the Bible. And so we're going to turn over to First Kings, a um, uh, second king, sorry, chapter twelve. And we're going to see now the story of Jehoash or Joash. And so, and we're going to read uh, verse 2. We'll start with reading verse 2. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Don't forget that saying. In all the days where Jehoiada the priest instructed him. And we're going to turn further over to, to see the end of what happened to um, Jehoash. And so there's a parallel passage in 2 Chronicles that we're going to turn to just to read the continuation of that story. So let's turn over in 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 24. And so we're going to go 2 Chronicles 24 and verses 17 through 25. And I'll read those out now. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers, and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he, being God, sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it. And require it. And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of the Syria came up against him, and they came to Judah and Jerusalem, and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people, and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. And further, we see, and when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada, 
the son of uh, the priest, and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. That's a really sad, tragic story. And he started off well. So that's our second king. So we've seen Rehoboam, and we've seen Joash. So just to give a little bit of background for the, uh, the kingdom and the time of Joash, um, just before him, Athaliah was a wicked queen who was ruling, and she put all kinds of abominations into the house of the Lord. They were serving all kinds of false idols and all kinds of wicked stuff. And Joash was the only heir that was going to be the next heir, but he had to be hidden and, and protected because Athaliah wanted to be ruler and she wanted to take over everything. And so Jehoiada actually made sure that Joash became the next king. And and he actually, a couple of ch chapters before, if you have a chance to read in Second Chronicles, it's really nice to see how Jehoiada actually helped bring back and institute back the, the commandments of the Lord. And so when Joash became king, everything, his own life, all that he had was basically because of Jehoiada. And so he served and he did things faithfully as long as Jehoiada lived. And then when he died, he did the exact opposite to the, to the point where he killed his own son. And that is just incredible. How could he be so unthankful? But so that's the second story that we see. And we see, we've already seen, we can see some of the conviction, some of the, the unwillingness to be corrected from these guys, these two kings. And there's a third king. And this king, thank God, is a, is a lot better than these first two kings. So we have something to be a little bit encouraged with. And this king is Hezekiah. So we're going to turn in 2 Chronicles chapter um, 29. So 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And we're going to read verses um, starting in verse 1 and 2. Hezekiah began to reign when he was tw uh, 5 and 20 years old. And he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. So now we see a king who is doing right in the sight of the Lord. And not just for, you know, a short period of time, not just because someone else is instructing him. And this is more like what we should be looking towards. Um, and we see that in, in the life of Hezekiah. And we're going we're gonna to spend a lot more time, actually, in Hezekiah's story. But I'm going to give a little bit more, we're going to go a little bit more into the passage so we can see some of the things that happened. And so 2 Chronicles 29, uh, verse 5, we see, And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed, and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs." And if we go down a little bit further into verse 10 and 11, we see Hezekiah's heart. And it says, Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. And he says in verse 11, My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. And let's go down to verse 15. And they gathered the, their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the result at the end of verse um, 36 of the same chapter, and Hezekiah rejoiced and all the people that God had prepared the people for this, for the thing was done suddenly. And so to give a little bit more background for Hezekiah, we're going to look into um, 2 Chronicles chapter 28 to see his father. So Ahaz was the king before Hezekiah, the father of Hezekiah. And Ahaz was another wicked king. There were so many wicked kings that we see in both Judah and in Israel. Um, but if we look into this verse in uh, 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 22, we're going to see why God was so angry at the people and why there was so much bad stuff in the time Hezekiah had to fix. So in verse 22 of the chapter... Um, 28, Second Chronicles 28, we see. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more? And this is talking of Ahaz. Yet more against the Lord. This is that King Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him, 
and of all Israel. And it has gathered together the vessels of the house of God, and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And in every several city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods, and to provoke the, uh, to anger the Lord God of his fathers. So we see that he did really wickedly, that he not only put bad things into the house of the Lord, he also prevented people from serving God. And that's a really, really sad testimony for someone who's supposed to be a king, who's supposed to be leading them in the law of the Lord, that he would do such wickedness. So now we've seen these three kings, right? We've seen Rehoboam, we've seen Joash, and we've seen Hezekiah. Now I'd like to go back into their stories and look more specifically at what their convictions were and were they willing to take correction. So let's go back to Rehoboam. So now that we've seen, you know, there's some good and there's some bad, let's, let's look back to uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. And we see in these verses that Rehoboam, after he's visited by Jeremoam and the people, he's given the opportunity to do what's right. No one can ever claim, hey, you know, I didn't have a chance to be convicted to do what was right. I never had a chance to be corrected. No one ever told me. No one ever taught me. The way that God is with us is he always wants to give us that chance to come back to him. He loves us so much that he always wants to give us correction and conviction. And so in these verses, we see that the people of God and Jeroboam came and pleaded with him and pleaded with Rehoboam and said, please, Rehoboam, just lighten the burden that you've given us. Remember, the chapter before, Solomon had been taking a lot of money from the people and imp imposing huge taxes. At first, he did it for God, but then at the end of his life, he was doing it to raise up false temples and false idols and to, to give lavish things to his, his wives that were serving other gods. Of course, the people shouldn't be happy to, to get involved with that. Of course, they shouldn't be thinking that they should have to bear the burden of that. And neither should God's church. You know, our church is a place where we sacrifice. A lot of us have to give, you know, our, our time, our energy, our money, so that the word of the Lord can go ahead, so that the gospel can be shared. But God forbid, if in our church or in any God-fearing church, that we come to a place where we're no longer putting those sacrifices towards the Lord and towards his worth and towards his building, towards his plan of salvation, towards his commandments, but instead we try to put it towards our pleasures or our happiness or our successes. That's not why the church is here. That's not why we sacrifice. And thank God that they, they fought against it because they're like, no, this is not right. And it won't be right for us. And I, I thank God that we are not in that position, but it's a good warning that we don't get to that position. And so we see further that with Rehoboam, he had the option of listening to the counselors of Solomon, the wisest king in the world. He had his counselors. Guys, that's like as if we had all of, you know, if you want to name smart people in the world sense, like Elon Musk and Bill Gates, and you had all these guys that you could take wisdom from, and they are going to tell you how to make a computer or make a business. Imagine you had all that wisdom, and you're like, nah, forget you, Elon. You don't know about cars. I'll make my own little dinky car here. He'd be like, no, you're crazy. What are you doing? Why are you following unwise counsel? Why, why do you think you're going to succeed? And so in these verses, we see that, um, look at, let's look again at verse 4. And it says, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. You know, Rehoboam was so stuck in his own convictions. He had convictions of his own. Like I said about the lady at the beginning of the story. Um, everyone has convictions. We all feel convictions about what we think is right or what's wrong. And the issue comes up when our convictions don't align with God's word. When our convictions... Even though they're in our heart, they're, they feel like they're right. But if those convictions are what's against God's word, those convictions are going to ultimately end up hurting us a lot. They're going to give us a lot of pain, whether it's, you know, uh, doing bad things in our lives, whether it's just being selfish and doing things that we want. It's not going to help us because it's not what God wants for us. God has a better plan for us, but we have to listen to that plan. If we don't listen to that plan, how can we, how can we have the success that God wants us to have? And so we see here that he was unwilling to serve others. And I noticed a trend, and I think you guys probably noticed it too, with Rehoboam and Joash and all these wicked kings, that they were so caught up in their own pride and their own um, self-importance and the fact that they had so much money and all these things, that they weren't willing to humble themselves and serve others. 
And that's a good warning sign for us as well, too. That's a, something to convict us that, hey, if we're at a position where we're not willing to, to humble ourselves, if, we're, if we think we know everything, if we think that we don't need help or to be corrected, we need to be careful. Like, why are we feeling that way? It's not, it's not a good way to feel. You know, the Bible talks about conviction and correction, that a man who's willing to take conviction and correction is wise, and a man who's not willing to take it is unwise. I'll talk about a couple of verses uh, in, in a minute, but I just wanted to, to finish up with Rehoboam here, because we see that even though he had conviction, his conviction was to do what made him happy. And in the world today, we have a lot of people that come to us and say, hey, do what makes you happy. Do what makes you feel good. You know, do what is best for you. But to be honest, those things, those pleasures, they're going to be so short. And what we get out of them is going to cost us much more than we're willing to give. At the end of it, we're going to look back at our life and say, oh, why did I do those things? Why did I not accept correction? I should have accepted correction, as the book of Proverbs tells us. And so we see that he forsook the counsel of the men, of the wise men. But he ended up listening to the young men who grew up around him. And that's another thing that we need to be careful with. A lot of us here are, you know, we, we go to work every day. Or, you know, a lot of people here are parents. And even if you're a son or a daughter, we have to be continually in teaching or being taught and being corrected. And with parents, we need to watch out who our kids spend time with. We need to watch out who we spend time with. Because if we're spending time with people who are telling us things contrary to God's word, if they're telling us things like, hey, you should drink, it's fun. Hey, you should come party with me. Hey, don't worry about cheating at work. Don't worry about lying. I'll help you get ahead. If we listen to those people that are telling us all these things, it's just as bad as what happened to Rehoboam, listening to the people that puffed him up, told them, oh, Rehoboam, you're awesome. You can push around the people. You can do whatever you want to them. No, that's not what God wants. God wants us to humble ourselves and say, hey, that's not right. I'm not going to have any part with that. And look what Rehoboam lost. He lost the 10 kingdoms, the 10 tribes, sorry, the 10 tribes of the kingdom, 10 out of the 12 tribes. I'm not the greatest at math, but that's most of the kingdom. He lost mostly everything. He had all the soldiers that he had. He had all the workers that he had. And the people didn't even ask him to get rid of all the tax. They just said, can you please lower the tax a little bit? Can you, can you just not be so burdensome to us? Can you just do what's right according to the Lord? You know, Jeroboam was already promised the kingdom. But when he came to Rehoboam, he didn't say, give me the kingdom. He came humbly and said, can you please lighten this tax and we'll continue to serve you? If only Rehoboam had done that, how much he could have saved. His life would have been so different. And guess what? Not only just him, all of Israel for the next however many generations, even up to this day, Israel, that part of Israel has not come back to the Lord because they're so pushed away from the Lord because they keep falling in the sins of Rehoboam and Jeroboam because Jeroboam didn't get any better. The sins of Jeroboam, look up the sins of Jeroboam. You'll see that he caused Israel to sin more than any other kingdom. He caused them to sin and sin and sin and sin. And you know what? In our teaching, if we don't teach the right thing, what's going to happen is we're going to teach the wrong thing. And people are going to fall into those sins and they're not going to be able to get out because without God, without Jesus, we're going to be stuck in our sins. And we're not going to get out of those sins. And so that's just from Rehoboam. Right? We saw a lot of bad things that he wasn't willing to be corrected by the right people and he didn't have the right conviction according to God's word. But let's look at Joash because sometimes... We start well, just like Solomon, but we finish poorly. So Joash in um, 2 Kings, let's go back to, to his, um, his verses. And Joash did that in verse 2. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Thank God that there are people who are teaching us. Thank God for parents. Thank God for our bosses at work. Thank God for our pastor. Thank God for the Sunday school teachers. Thank God for the police officers. Thank God for all those people who are doing right in our land today for us. Thank God for these people. We need to pray for these people and, and pray that God keeps convicting them to do what's right. Because those are the people that are helping us to do what's right. Without them, we might very easily go off and do our own thing. We might easily go and do a sinful thing because we think it's right in our eyes. But look at Joash. He did that which was right all the days that Jehoiada instructed him. But remember, we go further and we looked and saw that in the parallel passage in Chronicles that he didn't keep serving the Lord after 
um, Jehoiada's death. And he went and did very, very wickedly. And so let's look back again at um, uh, 2 Chronicles 24 and 17 um, and verse 17. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the, the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. So this was after the death of Jehoiada. And guess what? Somebody was going to come in and look to get the attention and to get the praise and to get all of what the king could offer. You know when they, where there's people in our lives that come up to us and they flatter us and they say, hey, you're so smart, you're so pretty, you're so this, you're so that. Here, you're so, you're so great. Do this thing for me. Help me with this thing. Do what I want you to do. We need to watch out for that because when people are flattering us and trying to pull us away from the Lord, it's very easy for our pride to get lifted up and say, hey, I am that great. Ooh, you know, I, I am pretty special. But are we really? No. No, we shouldn't be getting puffed up. People should be telling us if people love us, if friends love us, the, the wounds of a friend, you know, they're faithful. They, they, our friend is going to tell us the truth and say, hey, no, what you're doing is wrong. Love your husband. Love your wife. Don't sin. Don't go drink. Don't go party. Yeah, it may not, it may not feel good to hear those things. It may not feel good to be corrected. But at the end, we're going to be so much more thankful that someone actually cared enough to tell us the truth. And look, these, these princes, do you think they got off scot-free? No. They pulled him away from the Lord. And what happened when the Syrians came? They killed all of the princes. So let's, let's see that as well too. That Hey, you know, if, if we are in a position where we're like, ah, oh, you know what, I'll just tell my friend to do something. It doesn't have to be that great. Guess what? God's going to look at us. And God's going to see like, hey, what are we doing? We're going to be accountable for that. Maybe he's not going to kill us. Maybe he'll correct us. But do we need to put ourselves in a position like this? No. We shouldn't. We should be praying, Lord, please help us not to, to lead people astray. Help us to lead people towards Jesus. You know, that's why we have to focus our teaching on good things, sharing the gospel with people. And so we see that they, both these kings weren't willing to do the right things. And I wanted to share a verse on correction in teaching. And Proverbs 9 verse 9 says, Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. And Proverbs 6, 20 and verse 23 says, uh, 20 up to 23 says, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of of life. You know, these are the way that we should follow. This is how we should look at correction. You know, we saw those two kings. They weren't willing. And look what happened to them. And then let's look back again at Hezekiah. And I'm going to spend a bit more time here with Hezekiah because there's not really much that we can learn except the bad things from um, Rehoboam and Joash. But we can learn a lot more good from the life of Hezekiah. So let's go back into Second Chronicles 29. And... We already started, so we read and we said that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. I'd like to go further because after he got the people to get rid of all the wickedness out of the temple, after they, they uh, were working hard to do what was right, we see in the verse, at the end of verse, um, 2 Chronicles 29, uh, verse 36, and Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people. But we don't just see that. We see that, that God had prepared the people. And so... I don't, want, I don't want us, I don't want myself, I don't want you guys to get the idea that all I'm telling you here is like, hey, let's have amazing convictions for God and let's have correction and do what's right for God and we're going to be perfect and we're going to make it. Because we're not. Guys, if not for the mercy and grace of God, every single one of us here is going to be doing the exact wrong thing that we don't want to do. But God loves us so much and loved this people so much that he prepared the people Remember, just before this, Ahaz was one of the most wicked kings doing all this wicked abomination, yet God is still preparing the hearts of men and women. You know, that's a good reason too why when God puts conviction in our hearts to do what's right, guys, don't push that conviction away. That's the, that's the love and care of God to us so that we do right. You know, if not for that conviction, we'll do wrong. We will. And yeah, it hurts. It's, it sucks to be like, oh man, Lord, he's telling me I'm doing this thing that I shouldn't be doing. Okay, I need to do better. 
But isn't it so great that God says, I will forgive you. I love you so much. Hey, you know what? You messed that up, but guess what? We're going to try again. We're going to go again. Let's go again. Let's do what's right again. Let's fight for what's right again. You know, and, and, and it doesn't mean that we're going to be free from pain. It doesn't mean we're going to be free from hardship because we see that Hezekiah did all this great stuff. And, but look at the next couple of verses. Um, we're going to see, we're going to see some, some difficulty he has in teaching. And um, so in, in chapter 30, the next chapter, we see verse 2. Um, For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. And so this was important because for the people of Israel, God called them to be separate. God called them to uh, bring in the burnt offerings, the thanks offerings, uh, the sin offerings, to come to God and to, to ask for his help, to sacrifice to him. And what Israel was doing and what Judah was doing is they were turning to these false gods and they were saying, oh, help me, false god. Give me money. Give me these things. Because the nations around them were fighting and attacking them and they seemed successful. So they said, we're going to forsake God and we're going to bow down to these false things. But God said, no, that's not what I want. So Hezekiah had brought back, tried to bring back and instill what was right. And he took counsel. See, even a good king like Hezekiah had to take counsel. So none of us can say, hey, you know, I'm too smart. I'm smart enough that I don't need anyone to tell me. I can just do it on my own. No, even the wise king like Hezekiah needed counsel. And we all need counsel. But he tried to install the Passover. And so he's trying to do what's right. He got everyone to go away from the sins. He took out the things from the temple. And then he calls and he writes a letter. And so as we keep reading in this passage, I won't read all of it because we don't have time, but... He, re- he sends a letter in verse 6. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes through all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Remember, Assyria has now taken them captive, and God is trying to help bring them back. He wants to forgive them. He's waiting with open arms saying, Come back to me sacrifice to me, serve me, love me, and I'll bring you out of this captivity. But guess what the people said? In verse 8, um, we see that he continues to warn them. And he says, Now be not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. He knows already. Hezekiah knows how stiff-necked these people are. That's why they ended up in captivity in the first place. But he's warning them, don't be stiff-necked. Nevertheless, what happens in verse 10? So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim, Manasseh, and even unto Zebulun. But they laughed him to scorn and mocked him. How much worse could it get for these guys? They've lost their wives. They've lost their children. They're in captivity. How much worse does it have to get for them? How much worse sometimes does it have to get for us? before we come back to the Lord. You know, God says he loves us so much, he's going to chasten us as his children. It hurts sometimes. Like, I've been chastened by the Lord in a lot of things, and it hurts. You know, when I was far away from the Lord, and I was doing bad things, when I was doing drugs, when I was partying with all my friends, it was painful. It hurt. And I, I, I don't recommend it for anyone. I don't recommend anyone going to those kind of vices or sins. Because what happens when you go down that path, you put yourself in pain. And you think you're going to get out of it, but it keeps coming. It doesn't go away. It just keeps coming. But these people, they were so stiff-necked. They were so hard-hearted. Guys, let's not be this hard-hearted. Don't be this hard-hearted. Because when God's trying to correct us and convict us, I don't know what God's talking to you about today. I'm literally just speaking about conviction and correction. I don't know the specific issues that we're all dealing with. And I don't need to know. God knows these issues. But he wants to work on these issues in our heart. And he wants to work on them today. You know, if something is pricking you today, right now, get it right with the Lord today. And we all, if we're honest, we all have something. Maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's a big thing. Whatever it is, though, get it right. And then we can have joy like Hezekiah. We can be happy in in the walk with the Lord that we have. You know, God wants us to keep serving and keep going. And if Hezekiah had stopped and he hadn't continued to keep serving God because of these these detractors, these people that were looking to scorn him and mock him, if he had stopped, he would have missed out on a lot more blessings that God had for him. So that's another thing I wanted to to encourage us today with is that don't stop doing what's right. You know, guys, we're here at church. That's one, that's one step. We're listening to God's word. I hear the choir just before I started here. 
praising God, these are the things that God wants for us. This is what he wants us to do. Let's not quit when we get discouraged. When we tell someone the gospel and they're like, that's stupid. I don't need to do that. You go to church on Sunday? I work on Sunday. <laughs> I'm making more money. No. We need to, to do what's right. And, and look at the, the next verse. Because if he had stopped, look what would have happened. Look what would have been missed. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. How many of his brothers and sisters that had fallen away into sin came back to God because he was willing to tell the truth? Let's stand up and tell the truth because people will come back to God. There is power in, in God's word to heal and to save us. And so if we keep going down in this passage, we see that the people came. And I'd like to encourage us too because, you know, sometimes when I'm far away from God or if I struggle with reading my Bible or if I struggle with being angry or if I struggle with being corrected, because, you know, I'm, I'm 30, 34 now. Sometimes I don't always listen to my parents. Sometimes I don't always listen to my wife. Sometimes I don't always want to listen when someone else tells me something, if they're younger even. What, what if someone gives me some advice and says, hey, you should go get physio. And I'm like, I don't really want to get physio. But they're, they're younger than me. Should I, should I listen? Should I not listen? No, I should probably listen. It doesn't matter how old or young the person is. If they're giving you the right advice, you should take it. Right? We should. But if we look down here, what happens sometimes is that when we are doing wrong, we feel like we can't come back to God. We feel like, oh, I've done the same mistake again. I can't, I have to be perfect. Like, you know, I have to get my life in order before I come back to the Lord again, before I pray again. I haven't prayed for weeks. I haven't prayed for months, whatever it is. But in verse 18, we see the multitude of people came, but they had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. And look what, what Hezekiah did. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon everyone, and continuing verse 19, that prepareth his heart to seek God. Just like we sang a few minutes ago, Lord, our hearts, have our hearts. We don't have to come to God perfect. We don't have to come to God having cleansed our ways, having changed our life, having become this, this uh, worthy thing to, this worthy person to to serve him. We need to come to God exactly as we are, exactly as we are. Cause we're every day a sinner. We're not going to change. We're still sinners today, tomorrow, the next day, we're still going to be sinners. But when we come to God and we are open and humble and saying, Lord, you know, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with this thing right now. Help me. God will give us the strength to, to get over that issue. God will forgive. He will pardon everyone that's prepared their heart because he sees our heart. He knows our heart. He knows what we're thinking. You know, in all these things, we see these kings, we see Rehoboam, we see Joash, we see Hezekiah, and part of me feels a little bit like something's missing. Because I was talking with Sharon, my wife, the other day about it, and I said, you know, it's so sad. Why wasn't there just, like, one king that did it right? And she had to be like, honey, like, think about it. No king is perfect. None of them is going to do it right. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> right? Like, no king is just going to do everything right. But there is one king that did everything right. And so I'd like to contrast these kings with our king, our Lord and Savior. And, you know, this king did everything well. This king was a joy to his father and mother. This king came and lived a sinless, perfect life. And he's our example. If we want to look at any king, if we want to look to any king, any person that we should try to emulate or live our life by, let's look to Jesus. Because Jesus is our perfect example. And you know, I was reading, I was reading a bit in my Bible and looking up verses about teaching about Jesus. And I was really shocked at some of the things when I started reading them because it, it made me think a little bit more about how much conviction Christ had and how he never needed to be corrected. Isn't that amazing? Every time someone came to him and said, you shouldn't do this in the temple. He's like, no, that's not how it is. You're supposed to love God first. You're supposed to love people first. When they said, oh, what about this woman caught in adultery? He said, no, you judge if you have, if you have no sin, you judge. He was perfect. Every time someone tried to, 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 to take his words, make them wrong, every, when he got lashed, he never, he never responded back. He, he was accused. He was mocked. He never, he never did the same. And so I was looking at some of these verses, and I want to look in some of these verses real quick. I don't know, how, how are we for time? I don't want to take too much time. So we're going to go quick. We're almost done. We're almost done. 
Um, but let's look in um, Luke uh, 13 and verse 22. Thank you guys for being patient. And so Luke, Luke uh, 13 and verse 22. And this is talking of Jesus. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. I've read this passage so many times. I'm sure we've all read it a lot, where you just read through something. Oh, Luke, yeah, he walked here, he did this, he did that. Not really that important. But look at the verse carefully, and it says, he was teaching through the cities and the villages. What's important about that? It's important because he didn't just go to the main places. He didn't just go to, like, the Toronto of his day. He went to this small little out-of-the-way village where there was two or three people because he wanted to teach them about the truth. You know, we need to go out to these small, out-of-the-corner, out-of-the-way places and share the truth. Why is it that God uses us all for the gospel, to share the gospel? Because we're going to go into these small places that not everyone can get to. You know, where you go is going to be different where I go. Where someone else goes is going to be different from someone else. And each one of us has the responsibility to bring the gospel with us and have conviction and care enough about the lives of other people that they will do what Jesus did and go to the small places. And don't, don't, um, don't think that it's not an important thing that when you go to the grocery store that that person hears the gospel. It is important because that person needs it. You know, sometimes I forget. Like, I'm, I'm teaching myself here again too. Like, I should give a tract if I can. Dang it, I should, I should give a tract. I shouldn't forget that. But so there's one good verse. And Luke 21, verses 37, Luke 21, verse 37. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. And at the night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called Mount of Olives. So in the daytime, he was teaching. God made it, Jesus made it a purpose that he would go during the day when he had time to make time to go and share the gospel. He had that conviction. We need to have that conviction. We can't just say, hey, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next month. No, we can't wait. He didn't wait, and we shouldn't wait. If we're going to follow his example, his perfect example, we need to do that too. And Luke 23 and verse 5. Luke 23 verse 5 says, And they were more, the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When I read this, I don't know why God really put up a light bulb for me, seeing that Jesus taught from Galilee all the way up to Jerusalem. Now, I didn't know much about how far that distance is. And when I took FBI, you start to see the map. And you see that there's like quite a distance between the places that Jesus traveled. But I looked it up and an average um, distance from uh, Galilee up to Jerusalem is 148 kilometers. Who tracks their steps today? Like, or does step count? Anyone? Yeah? Yeah, I track my steps sometimes. You know on your iPhone it has a step count? So we do like... For example, uh, men and women do an average, men do an average of 5,340 steps a day. And women do around 400, uh, 4,912 steps. For this journey, it was 148 kilometers from there to there. That's 1,994, uh, no, sorry, 194,225 steps. Almost 200,000 steps. And Jesus had enough conviction that he walked every one of those steps so that he could share the gospel with people. How much do we walk? How, have our feet hurt from walking to share the gospel? Have we been convicted enough to say, these people need the gospel so much, we need to do that? Sometimes I haven't. I remember sometimes when I have, where I've, I've gone out and you, know, you, you, you share and you give out tracts to you, you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. I can't give out another tract. But then there's other times where we don't give it out at all. Can't we take another step for those who need to hear the gospel? I think we can. And there's another verse here that uh, in Mark 49, I won't, uh, Mark 14, 49. This will be one of our, one of our last verses, but Mark 14, 49. Mark 14, 49. I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. And this shows me that Jesus made it a habit 
It wasn't just one day. It wasn't just one week. It wasn't just one time. He made it a habit. We all have habits, right? Like, you know, we chew gum a certain way. We hold our pen a certain way. We read our Bible a certain way. Do we have the habit of sharing the gospel? Is that a habit for us every day? It's a good question to ask. And then um, my second, yeah, there's Matthew. Okay, so there's there's three more verses, but um, I'm trying to save some time here. But okay, so Matthew 4 and 23. Let's go there really quick. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. He went all about. That's another thing. Wherever we go, we should bring the gospel. He taught the gospel wherever he went. We should be, even in our lives, it should be a picture of the gospel. Where we go, even if we don't say the words, are we being kind? Are we being helpful? Are we being, are we being Christ-like when we go out? This is a conviction for me because sometimes I forget when I'm outside of the church and I go and I'm in a rush. Am I being kind to that person who's literally just trying to serve me and help me? When I'm when I'm curt with them, when I'm short with them, is that a good thing? No. But what if that person needs to hear the gospel? What if that person needs help? What if that person's having a bad day too? You know, like when Christ was going, he didn't think about himself. He thought about what who else can I serve? Who else can I help? And I'd like, to, um, I'd like to submit today as well, in um, the verse Luke 5, uh, Luke 5 and verse 17. Luke 5 and verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. You know, when Jesus went out and he taught, he was convicted and his teaching was compelling. He was confident because there was power in that teaching and there was power in the truth. And I've already said it before in Life of Hezekiah, we saw that what he did affected people for good and changed people to come to do what's right. The same way that Jesus did it, that there was power because God's word is powerful. And so let's let's remember that, that, you know, when we go out, it's not our strength. Even what I'm sharing with you today, you know, I'm not teaching you anything. This is not me. This is God's word. You know, don't take it from me. Like, you know, I'm 34. A lot of you guys probably a lot more wise than I am. Don't take it from me that I'm telling you these things. Take it from God. Like, I don't want you to learn about me. I don't want you to learn my bad habits. I want you to learn the good habits of the Lord. And thank God that he has all those good things for us. And so uh, let's close with a word of prayer and uh, take a little bit of time to just think about some of the things that we've gone over today. Dear Lord, we thank you today that you've uh, encouraged and convicted us and corrected us, Lord, in a lot of areas today. And I thank you, Lord, that there's something for every one of us today something that we need to be corrected on, something that we need to be convicted on, something that we need to continue doing if we're doing what's right. Because it does, it does have an impact, Lord. And what we teach others and how we teach ourselves will affect our lives and will affect those around us. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, died for our sins and forgives us of our sins so that we can go on and help others. Help us, Lord, to have the attitude that we care like you cared, that we are convicted of the right things, Lord, not of trivial things and meaningless things. And I just thank you, Lord, for our church that we do have conviction. And I see conviction that we have good teaching. And I see conviction that people want to serve you and love you. And I'm, I'm encouraged by it. Just the way Hezekiah was encouraged to see people serving the Lord, let us keep doing that, Lord. Let us keep doing that today and tomorrow and just keep doing that until you come. You know, Lord, even the last few days, I've seen all this evil stuff that's happened towards Israel. And how poorly your people are being treated. And I just wonder, you know, today are you going to come back? Tomorrow are you going to come back? But Lord, while you're not here present with us, and while we still have work to do, help us to see that 
we do have power in your name. And Lord, that we don't have to be perfect. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you just as we are, sinful as we are. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for falling short of the things that you want us to do. We all have something that you know we need to get right, Lord. And I just pray that today and every day that we make it a, make it a point that we come back to you and just humble ourselves and say, Lord, please help me. Forgive me for this thing I've done wrong because you are good to heal us and you are helping us. And Lord, I just pray for our, our church here that you'd protect all of us, Lord, especially in our thoughts because there's so many things that want to take our time. There's so many things that want to take our energy. There's so many things that want to puff us up and make us proud. Even this preaching today, Lord, I don't want people to look at this preaching and think that I'm trying to tell people things that I want them to do that as if I don't, as if I'm better. I'm not, Lord. And I'm just, we're all the same, Lord. But your word is right and your word is true. And I'm, I'm seeing that change my life, Lord. And I'm seeing it change the lives of our church. And I don't want that to stop, Lord. Help us to keep having momentum for serving you and loving you. And we thank you so much that uh, you protect us as we go home today. And even as the next few weeks we're getting ready for our Christmas film and other things that we're going to be doing in the church and uh, bring people who don't know you, Lord. And if there's anyone here today too, Lord, that doesn't know you or hasn't ever been forgiven, I just pray that they get it right with you and they ask and believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins so that they can go to heaven one day because he paid that penalty and he loves us enough for that. And he did live that perfect life so that we can have victory and that we can have forgiveness too. And we just thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. You're dismissed.